Hey, hello and welcome to Disciples Prosper. Grateful to have you here. Today, I want to talk about something dear to my heart, my family. Uh, you know, it's I've been super duper blessed and uh, I met a, an amazing woman at a service project uh, painting low income houses. And at the time, I was uh, I was 29 years old. Uh, I, I was just about to turn 29 years old. And um, in fact, our, our first date, spoiler alert, was uh, was to was something called the Manti pageant. Uh, and, and it was on my birthday, if I remember right, uh, which was in June of 2003. And but back up a little here while we're at this service project back up before this service project I want, I want to talk about recognizing the Lord's hand in your life so a few months prior to you know three years prior to me meeting my wife-to-be I was hospitalized and my world was turned upside down everything that I thought was important was stripped from me and I was humbled and I had the opportunity to learn what was really valuable. Uh, the people that came to visit me were my parents and my ecclesiastical leaders. That's it. I was in the hospital. So I, prior to that, I thought friends were all of that in the bag of chips. Like they are the, the theme. And I discovered how significant family was at that time. So I took a three year sabbatical from dating after that. I put on some weight. I'm like, who's going to want to marry someone with my baggage? Who's going to want to marry someone who has been through the ringer like I have? And I, I did some soul searching. I thought I was, I don't know, did God curse me? Did I do something wrong? What, what's wrong with me? And uh, three years into this searching for an answer. Why was I diagnosed with mental illness? Why was I given this challenge? I came across the quote, which I've shared previously, by Elder Neil A. Maxwell. And he said, often an invitation to greater consecration comes by means of painful personal experience. And when I heard that some three years after my incident of being a quarter to the hospital, I it just clicked for me and everything made sense to me. I realized that though I had been become fanatical prior to my hospitalization, that was a side effect of being a part of what got me into the hospital. But uh, so I was doing the best that I could, living the best that I could, and I continued to do the best that I could when I was medicated and doing and, and striving to not sleep 12 to 10, 10 to 12 hours a day, which I continued to do for many, many years. And the, the long story short is when I heard that quote, it clicked. It wasn't a curse. It wasn't a stumbling blocks. It was an invitation to be better, an invitation to raise the bar in my life and not to become fanatical about my faith, but to strive to live what I knew what was right. And as I did that, I, I chiseled down my list of 30 things I wanted in a future spouse, and I narrowed it down to five. And one of those was someone who was service oriented. So guess what happened? Instead of going, I, mean, I still went on a lot of dates after, after I made that paradigm shift. I started going on dates, like again, two or three dates a week, like I did prior to my hospitalization. But the, the caliper of girl that I dated was totally different. Um, you know, prior I, I would approach girls that I thought were attractive and like, you know, obviously one of my five was I had to be attracted to them, but there was different reasons. And the point I'm trying to make is the majority of that list of 30 things is what I thought other people would like. If I were married to someone like so, such and such a person, then other people would like me because I was married to her or, um, Sometimes people use the trite phrase, a trophy wife. And I, I really don't like that, um, that notion because every daughter of God is a trophy. Who, whatever circumstances they are or have been or raised in, they are more than a trophy. They are divine with amazing potentialities. And um, we need to see people for who they are and who they are to become and not judge them so much by the outward appearance as 
as the world often teaches because the, there are diamonds in the rough and that's that's kind of what I want to get at with today is is that my wife saw the diamond in the rough in me and I, my wife to be I should say and it was it was a godsend and now having been married for 30 years I recognize his hand in all things and I'm grateful that he gave me the experiences he gave me to prepare me to be married to someone as phenomenal as my wife so here's here's a bit of the backstory so we're I'm I returned back to school and just prior to returning back to school I started dating again as I was getting at and the the girls that I started dating were girls that I met as service projects the first ones there and the last ones to leave and how did I know that? Because I was the first one there, the last one to leave. I loved serving. I loved helping. I loved giving back. And I, and I loved other people that did the same thing. And so at the end of a service project, I would see, you know, four or five young ladies lingering. And I would decide in my mind's eye, like, I need to talk to them and approach them. Just like I had other girls in the past that I met in the library or wherever while I was in college. Um, and I would essentially get to know them and ask them on a date. And, and I gotta make a note on this. Asking someone on a date is like one of the greatest compliments you can give a woman. And I encourage you men that are single like to, to raise the bar in your dating habits because not only are you complimenting them, but that is a, a genuine way to serve. And it is our duty as in members of my faith to be as priesthood holders to date young ladies, not just hang out with them, but to actually take them on a date and get to know them. And if they reciprocate, awesome. That was kind of my general rule of thumb. I, I would take them on a date and if they reciprocated, then I'd ask on a second date. If they didn't and I really liked them, I want to give them another chance. Maybe they've never had someone who was genuinely interested and asked a lot of questions like I did. Um, I would ask a second date, and if they didn't reciprocate, then I probably wouldn't continue. So there's this give and take. So that was another one of my five things, someone who reciprocated and someone who was service-oriented. So it was amazing. When I started dating girls like this, my life changed. I started having relationships last longer than 30 days. It was phenomenal. And as a result of that, um, the third girl that I dated... Um, for more than 30 days ended up my wife to be and that was just months after I had the paradigm shift that my painful personal experience was an invitation to be better not just to be a good boy to but to be a holy boy to be like Heavenly Father just as Jesus was and he taught us to be uh, previously I had mentioned uh, the idea of being perfect uh, I'm, again, there, there's a huge distinction between perfectionism and perfection. And perfection is to live what you know, essentially, and to be aligned with God's will. And when you are, then you have access to his character, his perfections, and his attributes. I'm quoting from the Lectures on Faith, Lecture 3, verse um, 2 through 5. And this... this this whole notion, like the one reason so many people are talking about getting over perfectionism is because we as sons and daughters of God want to fulfill our divine destiny. And part of that divine destiny is to fulfill what Christ taught, to be ye therefore perfect. And we know that that's the thing to do. Yet often, as the human nature and the natural man in us wants to throw that out the window. Like, no, it's not possible. But I invite you to look at it from another angle. I start asking the question, how is it possible? Rather than, no, it's not possible. Because with God, it is possible. So so I start dating again, I, and, and I move back and I go back to, to Provo, Utah, where Brigham Young University is, and I enroll in school again. And, um, and I, I'm debating, I'm 29 years old and I'm at the threshold of where I need, I, I move to in, in our faith, you move to a, an adult singles ward, uh, rather than a student singles ward. And I started visiting the adult singles ward and the bishop of the youth, not youth, the, uh, the student ward 
scheduled an appointment with me, wanted to meet with me, and he said he had a strong impression that I should attend their ward. And uh, after some liber deliberation, I was like, okay, I'll do that, I'll attend. So I, moved, I, I ended up going to that ward and he called me to be the service committee chairman. So I, um, I, I organized a, a service project for um, our, our organization, our ward, to meet up with, uh, with Provo City that was federal, had a federally funded project called Paint Your Heart Out. And um, it was painting low income homes. There were about 300 people that showed up, roughly 300, and about 50 of those people came from our, our ward. And um, so we were assigned to two or three homes, the 300 of us. And the one home that we did do, I was being my gregarious self, like, hey, introducing myself, especially to the young ladies that I wanted to see, you know, they're there serving. I, I wanted to see who I would ask on a date at the end of the day, so to speak. And um, one of the young ladies I met was my wife to be, and uh, I just I didn't ask her on a date, but I got to know her, and I found out she lived in the same complex as me. She just moved in three weeks prior, and the you know the girl side of it, and um, was in the same ward as me, and uh, she was substantially younger than me. I was I was 29 and she was 21. Um, I was almost 29. Um, and, and because of that age gap, she kind of let her barriers down. It's like, oh, nothing will cover this. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's over the hills, <laughs> if you will. Um, so she, she, you know, she didn't have, she, she felt like she said when she was in my presence, she didn't feel like she had this pretense of, oh, I, what do I say? Or what do I not? She just was herself. And I loved that about her. It was amazing. So. I ran into her in campus uh, we, about a week later. I remembered details about her because I cared. I, and I learned from Del Carnegie that one of the best ways to quote unquote win friends and influence people is to be genuinely interested. And when you're genuinely interested, you remember factoids and you remember things about them. So I just followed up on her sisters and, and her family and a few things that she had talked to me about. And I got her phone number and I started calling and, and talking to her and dating her and um, and I was still dating two or three other girls and going on two or three dates a week and eventually I got to my family reunion which was coming up and I thought to myself hmm who should I take to my family reunion and I was considering a, t a couple of different girls and um, I decided to to invite uh, my my wife to be and uh, it was it was a challenging invitation for me because it was one of my greatest fears which was that a girl would meet my family and um, want to run because here I was a churchgoer but the majority of my family wasn't a churchgoer and um, and so that was kind of a great fear of mine and I'm not saying that all of them didn't go to church but the great majority didn't and I, I thought, you know, a girl may judge me and may want to run if, if she sees that my family isn't, you know, a temple goer and all these different things. Um, so fast forward uh, some time um, after we were engaged and we, uh, I, I asked her point blank, we might have even been married, like what, what happened when you like, how did you fall in love with me? Like that phrase, um, how did you make the decision to, to be married to me? And she, she said, when I met your family. I was like, what? This is amazing. What? How is that possible? So my greatest fear ended up becoming my greatest ally. And often that is the case in life. As I mentioned in a previous podcast, you know, we look at these trials and these tribulations from a victim mentality. Woe is me. Am I cursed? Am I this? Am I that? And the reality is those gifts of weakness are invitations to be better. And they become a, a tool in the belt. Or they become an asset. They, be, they give you the ability to empathize with other people. They give you the ability to 
to see and understand and have compassion on others, they, it's, just, it, it's a huge blessing. And when you see it from that light, it's, it's amazing. So I said to her, how is that possible that you, you fell in love with me meeting my family? What do you mean by that? And um, she said, I fell in love with you when I met your family because I saw how you treated them. I was like, what? And I, I'm just not, I just normally love people. I, I love my family. I love strangers. I love, I love helping people. Like I, you know, as a side hustle right now, I am a shuttle driver and I take people to and from the ski resorts to the airport and back and forth. And it is, it's a delight to meet and share and talk to people and learn about their stories and where they're from and to share some of my story and just bond with people that are from another state and from other, another country. And it's just invigorating. So back to family. So um, the point I want to extract from this is that my wife saw in me, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this, I believe I'll put this in the, in the notes if I can, the, a picture of me, if not, I'll do it in the Instagram account. A picture of me when I was married. I was about 260 pounds and uh, it was chunky. And But I was full of love, full of service, and I had to turn my life over to the Lord. And I had the baggage of mental illness and had the baggage of a broken, broken family. Um, and this amazing woman who was humble and had the many, many, many of the attributes of Christ saw the diamond in the rough. And I hope that you see the diamonds in the rough too, because we are all sons and daughters of God. And like C.S. Lewis teaches, that we are, if you saw the average Joe in his true glory of who he really is and is to become, you would be tempted to worship them. And it's, it's suggesting to the mind that Seeing your potentiality, uh, again, coming back to the analogy from uh, that I learned as an 18-year-old boy through a spiritual impression, like a kitten becomes a cat, a puppy becomes a, a dog, a colt becomes a horse, children become adults, children of God become like Heavenly Father. And that understanding that divine purpose of life seeing things through this concept through this lens gives you great power and gives you great confidence before him and your fellow man and it enables you to have joy it enables you to seek to serve others and to get lost in the service of others okay so bring this all back together i'm at work today doing my side hustle talking to my wife with some downtime in between rides. And my boys, my three and five-year-old boys are keep trying to take the phone from her while she's trying to talk to me about uh, some budget uh, budget things. And I, I was, I was pretty, uh, pretty uh, out of gas, uh, having worked many, many hours this past week. And it just, it was just kind of put me over the edge. Like, you know, I'm going to call in and see if I can go home. So I've done that. I called in and I said, Hey, I'm exhausted. And I got some boys that are fighting over the phone. I need to spend some dad time. Uh, can you get me covered for the rest of today and uh, get me home? And she, and she called back a few minutes later. I got you covered. You're out. And I'm like, yes. And here I am on my way home recording this podcast and sharing with you that family is essential and Salvation, which we've talked about previously, is to know God and to know Him individually. But exaltation, as the brethren have teach, is a family affair. And what good is it, an analogy I love, what good is it to, um, to get to a homecoming party and be the only one there? And that's the thing, is the homecoming party, when this life comes to an end, when this mortal life comes to an end, is going to be grand because you're going to be surrounded by the people that you have loved, that you have served, that you have helped come unto Christ. And it will be an amazing party. Um, put your family first, take care of them, and 
but before you can take care of others, you got to take care of yourself and you got to be square with the Lord and you got to live by his spirit. So thank you for joining me today. It's been great with, to be with you. Have a good one.